Yeah, uh, they're, they, I, I've asked my, my uh, uh, upperclassmen when I've had them, do you know the names of any historians? No, like they generally, know, even though they maybe have had a class with a historian, they forget that. But you know, like they, they uh, uh, no, they really don't have a lot of a, a, a sense of it. And it, it's part of that is is you know what we value um, as a culture. Uh, a lot of people are are wondering, you know, what are the point of the humanities in modern you know, culture? Uh, do you get a return on your investment? Um, uh, what are the humanities for? Um, and the humanities are for a lot of things. I mean, it's even asking the question is kind of getting it wrong. Um, the humanities are, you know, they allow us to uh, put ourselves inside the heads of other people to anticipate what arguments are going to be made when we're making arguments on behalf of whatever cause it is, right? To anticipate what they're going to say, to recognize where their logical errors may be, uh, to uh, 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 communicate with people in, in other languages. There are lots of things that the humanities are for. And then, not, that, not the least of it, you know, is the uh, sheer enjoyment of, that you can get from studying some of these topics. So, so is it meaningless to say that, the, uh, that, uh, that culture does not exist without the humanities? Is it a sort of a, you can't have one without the other? Well, if there is a culture, we'll freaking well study it. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the things we kind of discovered before this panel began is that there's a bit of a controversy, right, in, in the movement, in the skeptic movement, in the, in, the, in the atheist movement, and it seems that the humanities folks are kind of buttoned up against the, the science, science folks, right? Is that the way to describe it? And we actually thought about getting together before this panel and discussing everything and ironing out all the controversy. And then we thought, you know, it's going to be more fun than we did. That was actually Herb who suggested, yeah. let's just do it here together, right? Yeah. Um, so, what that is is a, uh, a, a controversy that's been called the two cultures after C.P. Snow's 1950s or 60s uh, essay. Yeah, way back in yesteryear, long before the Twitters. Um, uh, C.P. Snow called it the, the, the uh, two cultures. You have the science culture and you have the uh, humanities culture. And every so often, the the, the there's an upswelling of mutual uh, uncomprehension um, and hostility that seems to pit the, the sciences against the humanities in some pretty pointed ways. Um, a number of, of people who I would consider skeptical superheroes and uh, science communicators of, of real value um, have said some really unfortunate things about the humanities. Um, so, for instance, um, uh, we can start with you know uh, someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is a master in some ways, a master storyteller. Um, uh, he, when you allow him, uh, uh, when he speaks off the cuff, he brings passion and, and, and persuasive energy to 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 everything that he does, right? Um, but then, you know. He, at one point, he was, um, uh, this was a couple of years ago, it was at a, some sort of science fair, uh, public science fair in New York, uh, where he was lamenting um, innumeracy. Um, and so he has, uh, he, he, he's, and I'll read this to you, because it's, um, it, it, it sums up a lot of the, the hostility, I think. I can tell you for what it's worth that scientists by and large, are actually quite knowledgeable in areas outside of science. If you go home, go to the home of most scientists, there will be Bach and Beethoven and Shakespeare on the shelves. And they might not know as much as the literary scholar, but one thing that I think as a nation we should be embarrassed is, is that the scientists, and you can do the experiment, experiment yourself, I've, I've done the experiment, the scientists by and large know more liberal arts than, this, uh, than, uh, than the science that is known by the liberal artists. And that needs to change. If you go to a science cocktail party, I didn't even know that they had those. Oh, oh man. man. That's oh, an amazing party. Oh, oh, it was a star party. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm. Dragon concert yesterday here. Um, uh, if you go to a science cocktail party uh, and someone talks about Shakespeare, no one's going to say, oh, I was no good at Shakespeare. I was terrible at nouns and verbs. 
you'll never hear that. But you can go to a liberal arts or artist parties and someone will be talking about math and say, oh, I was never good at math, I hated math. And they'll all chuckle and they'll all agree and they'll all like sip the next sip of champagne and go on talking about the art. And that's somehow okay. No, that's not okay. You don't have to be a scientist, but at least understand what's going on in the world. Scientific decisions inform political decisions and you all vote. So he wants to you know, excite you about becoming scientifically literate. Which is great. Which is, I totally uh, agree with, yeah, um, it, it, as far as it goes. But you're damn right, English teachers often hear, I was no good at English, I could never write. I, I mean, I, since I was a, an undergraduate, well, no, what's your major? Uh, English? Oh, I hate writing. I hate reading. I still hear it. People will say, I haven't read a book since high school. I haven't read a book, or I don't read, not, I only read nonfiction. Uh, I would like to deal. Right. You know, I just to uh, piggyback on what Neil deGrasse Tyson said. Yeah, I hear you know from students uh, or when I was teaching. You know, I hate math. I I just can't do math, and they don't seem embarrassed by it, They're saying it's not my thing. I've never heard a student say, you know, I can't read or write, and if they can't. They would feel shame about it, but in our culture, I think there's not enough shame about being mathematically or scientifically illiterate. And what, be, and what seems to be getting worse is now they're talking about even science being fake. Why even learn it? Because these scientists are, uh, have their own prejudice, like they, they admit the global warming and the like. And we don't have people engaged. Uh, in, uh, and and the way that you would, you know, that you transform the uh, public psyche about that is through the arts that are that are practiced in the humanities, through uh, debate, uh, through effective communication, um, understanding uh, what's going on in your audience's head, and really getting into why they're 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 not on board, understanding their motivations. Um, these are all things that are developed in the humanities and practiced in the humanities. So if, if you want more science education, give people more humanities. Um, the one class um, that is, as far as I can tell, required among all first-year students at just about every university is the intro to writing class, intro to college writing and, and, and reading classes. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's because the, the skills that are learned in that classroom uh, apply to just about every other area of study um, you will benefit from having effective writing and thinking skills. Um, when it comes to something like um, uh, the sciences, they don't teach the logical fallacies, right? And the, well, some, some do. I get it. They are the universally covered in everyone. Yeah, in, in composition classes and in rhetoric classes. Um, we, we, that's what we teach. Um, and we're, yeah, we're expected, well, to teach everything. I mean, the, the we're, critical thinking, um, research is always a part of the, the freshman writing classes, so we're teaching how to evaluate sources, um, what's a reliable source, what's not a reliable source, how do you tell. And some um, of the stuff that they were talking about in the fake news panel. Exactly, looking for, for bias or, or at least slant. Um, it's telling the difference between something that, that's factually based and objective and something that is an argument, although, you know, that's a, a continuum. Um, so there are an awful lot of things that really are arguments, including analysis and so on. Um, and then at, once we taught them that, sometimes you have to tell them to dial back because they, anything that has a perspective, they go, oh, it's biased. Like, you know, you know it's, it's okay to have a point of view, and are you a point of view? Because that's what this class is. Um, so you should be doing that. Uh, but you have to be aware that obviously people have perspectives. So we do that. Um, we, we talk about audience, so we talk about how people are uh, appealing to uh, readers or, or audiences to make them persuasive, uh, including we consider manipulative ways of doing that um, and try to tell them, naughty, don't do that, but also to be aware of it. 
Um, well, it's production and reception of arguments. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and then to build a good, uh, honest argument, you know, using what we call logos in the, the red field. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, evidence. Yeah. You know. Evidence, good logical re reasoning. Not Showing us where you got your ideas, all things that are very important. When I first heard about the debate, you know, the, the, uh, it, it just seemed to me almost like a, like a geek fight between academics, you know, the sciences, the humanities. And then I thought to myself, well, I'm kind of in the middle because I'm not an academic. You know, I've, I, most of the, I mean, I, I have a college degree, but most of the things I've learned, like I, I traveled around the world for three years studying all the different religions and different languages and stuff. And, um, and so where does that put us? Maybe there's a third element to it, too. What about those people who have learned a lot of what they know by experiential doing and living life and stuff like that? Is there a third element here? The humanities, the sciences, and then those people, make probably many who are in the audience who yeah. just have lived and experienced things in life, right? But is that a third perspective? When you build it as a war between these, to me it's kind of like the war on Christmas. It really doesn't exist. It's uh, I think we're all saying that science and humanities are important. Uh, educated people should know a little about both, and perhaps a lot about one of them, at least yeah. if they're in academia. Uh, the problem I see is uh, what is okay to not know? And I think when it comes to math and science, most educated people who are not in those disciplines feel less uncomfortable not knowing uh, about mathematics and uh, calculus, uh, whereas scientists, I think, would feel a little more uncomfortable not knowing about the basics of humanity. Well, well, I was just going to point more. So you were, you were talking about your experiential knowledge. I'm not, I'm not clear on how that means that you're not experiencing the culture that was constructed of a humanities sort of base. Because it's their culture without humanity. Yeah, the difference is, is maybe learning uh, things while living rather than from books or from school, you know, from, from something, you know, presented via text or via teacher versus learning, you know, like, you know, I go to different countries, um, some of which are at war right now, you can't even go to them anymore, and, and just go study with those religious people, study that religion in person and just learn, you know, straight from that religion, rather than reading about it first from books, and just trying to experience that, that, that situation or that religion first. One, one of the, I mean, if, if the, the, I would say that what you're doing is, is, is if that's the approach that you're going to take, um, it, it sounds like you're going to be recreating the wheel a lot, because there are people with real expertise in these religions who will be able to give you uh, maybe some understanding of why, you know, certain things are happening in this religion, why they you know, you, why don't you see paintings on the wall? You know, like, things like that, you know, and draw your attention to, to that fact. Um, where you, so you don't have to go travel to outer wherever, you know, in, in order to have... Outer well, wherever well, well, one, one, yeah, one, one, one example of that, you know, for example, I studied Buddhism, you know, in, in, in India for, for about eight months. And what we would do is study it as it was you know, meant to be practiced, so we would like meditate for 10, 12, 14 hours a day, it's complete silence. And, and it was a transformative experience because of that. Had I taken a college course about Buddhism, I wouldn't have been subjected to an experience like that. I would have read about people who did that. Oh, but you, you could also be interested enough to go and do it. You're like, that sounds great. I'd like to, I'd like to try that as an experience. That. You know, so many academics that I know have, have never, you know, don't have the time to actually wind up doing that. You know, they, they study so much from the books and from the teachers about the books that they never do the experience. Well, you, you have cultural anthropologists who do go into, the, into these cultures, um, and they're one of these areas that's a little bit science and a little bit humanities. So they're kind of like in between. Social sciences. And yeah. Um, and. But yeah, I'm not all for giving you know scholars more time to travel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, but you want to see a fight get cultural anthropologists together with physical anthropologists. But you guys have to good point too. I mean, I think I think all the tools should be embraced, and uh, and and no one tool should be held above the other. I mean, you know, the humanities should be studied fully, and, and the sciences, mm -hmm. and and we shouldn't have those gaps. I mean, is that is that really the point that we're trying to make, or, or is there? 
<laughs> yeah. Well, one point I've seen with academics, and this goes across uh, math, science, humanities, and all, uh, we're required to publish, and that's primarily what we're evaluated on. And most people who publish tend to think that their field of research is more important than the others. So they oh, get to be more narrow in their discipline, don't communicate with people, not just in uh, humanities, but in other branches of mathematics. And it's kind of like the, uh, you need to know a lot about a little in order to be successful, with the extreme being to know everything about nothing. The, the field becomes so narrow. That's a problem also of teaching writing when we teach research. Um, because it, everything, we're supposed to encourage them to, the, the gold standard is always peer-reviewed scholarly papers. Um, the thing is, tell them to go read a peer-reviewed scholarly paper. They're not written for 18-year-old college <coughs> They're not written for people out, often outside a very narrow field. So sometimes you read a peer-reviewed uh, scholarly paper and blah, 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 you know. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it can good. be in a field like, closely related to yours, and it's pretty bad. So. Um, they don't really have anything exciting to say about that, but they, that it is a, a difficulty um, for te teaching research. And so, tell them, oh, peer reviewed, that's the best. Okay, you're not going to understand it. You're not going to be able to summarize it. But it's the best. You know, when, when I first got my PhD and was uh, applying for different jobs, my advisor gave me this advice. If you give an hour colloquium, make the first 20 minutes something that everyone can understand so you, they'll see you're a good teacher. The next 20 minutes, only experts in your field can understand to show you're involved in research. And the last 20 minutes, something that no one can understand, <laughs> which will show you're such a, an important specialist. <laughs> so um, well, part of the, the, the seminar was about teaching writing and the uh, things like folklore, cultural studies that have been ignored in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I'm looking around Dragon Con and I'm seeing really obscure references that have <laughs> become <laughs> mainstream, at least in this subculture. So, uh, can y'all talk a little bit about that? Okay. Anything in particular? Yeah. It's very, very wrong. Okay, well, should we change that? Well, well that's not you know, I think one of the really interesting things, you know, we were talking about folklore. Uh, I mean, we're definitely seeing modern folklore, and we're seeing uh, uh, modern heroes being created in pop culture all the time. It's worth understanding where they come from. Uh, you make you got a little bit more enjoyment from understanding the backstory about, you know, uh, the Guardian, the, the Guardian the people, and why the tree is small in the second one. You know, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you if you believe that that the stories that we tell uh, uh, reflect something about our concerns, um, yeah, I think that you know, uh, the humanities are, are always relevant. Well, uh, does it? I mean, the, of course, it would help to know these these broader cultural yeah. themes of the, the, the superhero arcs, the things like that that you can also see in, in religious studies and um, some of the religious texts. Yeah. Because those are works of literature. In a matter of speaking, yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they may not be good literature. Job is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one, one thing I've kind of seen, you know, from, from you know, just interviewing scientists and, and speaking with them, a, a lot of times it seems like the scientists give concrete, factual, evidence-based perspectives on things, and when someone is steeped in that genre, they tend to think, you know, that's all that really matters, because everything else is so, so subjective, and to them, they lose, they, they might kind of feel like, you know, subjectivity is not as important. And is maybe this what kind of starts to fuel some of the, 
the problem between the two? I think one of the, the, the problems that people don't recognize that the vast majority of the work that's done in the humanities is evidence-based um, and held to standards by their peers. Um, uh, you, you talk about somebody who's, who's beavering away in an archive somewhere looking at the history of Renaissance business practices or whatever their, you know, floats their boat. Um, but, you know, uh, and they have to garner evidence to make convincing arguments. Well, take religious studies, for example. I mean, all, all, most religions are based on a core supernatural premise, for example. You know, I mean, let's use Christianity, for example. Jesus rose from the dead. Without that, no Christianity, right? But that's not an evidence-based assumption because there is no evidence for that. Well, there no is evidence. It's no not great evidence, but there's evidence. No, there's controvertible evidence for that. Well, not, yes. not as in mathematics or, some, or the other sciences. Right? Well, that is one thing that often, I mean, there's evidence, but there's, in humanities, it's not incontrovertible evidence. As you put it, it, it may not be replicable. It's a matter of, it is like analysis or evaluation. That you are presenting, if you're like doing a literary analysis, you're presenting evidence. It's usually textual based or contextually based, um, and it can be perfectly valid. There well, may be another <laughs> analysis that's totally opposed to it that's also I mean, perfectly valid. On, okay. but still okay. Jesus rose from the dead. What evidence can we have of that? Hearsay? Is that well, evidence? Hearsay is evidence. It's but not we great have. evidence, but it is evidence. Well, but that's not that's not valid courtroom type of evidence because we can't interview those 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 witnesses. So all we have is a claim by a claimant who has vested interest in the claim. So it's a propaganda piece, perhaps. Well, I think the, the the kind of religious studies or theological studies that we're thinking of aren't the argument isn't. Jesus, Jesus right. totally rose from the dead. Well, the fact that you can't well, that it may not be, but it's it, it, it a study. To, to read it's like the theology, theology. That, that it's not so much a, a study of God, but a study of religions, of religions and religious belief. And so you, you, you're looking at. You have to understand that people believe that. You, this, this, you have to understand that people believe that Jesus rose from the dead in order to understand the Crusades. You know, like that, that's very that's important. You know, um, regardless of whether or not it's true, that's a different question. May yeah, I know, I'm sorry. A, an example that I actually have sort of an academic interest in, um, and some skeptical people may be interested in this too. Uh, the undead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in medieval ghosts and revenant stories, and. There are some odd things that go on with them. The medieval ghost stories were really, really popular, uh, or they were very popular during the Middle Ages. And most of them, interestingly, come out of monasteries. Um, there's also a little bunch of revenant stories. They're sort of like folklore vampires. And some of them, they say they suck blood. Um, they are contained in Northern Europe, mostly. So. Why? Why do we have these two different ways of looking at uh, or having a genuine belief about the return of the dead? And, well, it's much too complicated to explain. But you kind of need, have to understand some of the religious views at the time. The reason those ghost stories become really popular um, in the Middle Ages, particularly in the High Middle Ages, and the High Middle Ages and Late Middle Ages, is because of the, the doctrine of purgatory developing. Um, like St. Augustine, his attitude was, you know, the saved wouldn't come back and the damned couldn't come back. So no ghosts. Um, which is not to say no one believed in ghosts, but it wasn't the official view of the church. But as purgatory develops, the idea is, well, maybe those guys could come back and maybe they would come back because they have unfinished business. So you get ghost stories that are actually supporting the doctrine of purgatory. That's why they're coming out of monasteries. And then, not only do they support the doctrine of purgatory, after a while, they support, hey, you know what you should do? You should give money to this monastery to have masses in it. <laughs> um, and 
And then, at the Reformation, you have very different views of ghosts, depending on whether people are Catholic or Protestant. See, I thought you were going to say it's because people back in, in those times didn't have a good understanding of science. Well, they had, I mean, different ways of, of knowing the world, certainly, or limited ways. They, there were a well, lot of things they, they had knowledge that they didn't have access to. But even, even today, you know, between science and humanities, we might be talking about different meanings of evidence. For instance, I used to be an agnostic saying, as a mathematician, I can't prove there is no God. I don't have that kind of evidence. Uh, then I heard an atheist is someone without a belief in any gods, so I became an atheist. And it was more definitional, not theological. For a mathematician, uh, evidence consists of a proof. And once the proof is established, you know, uh, there was a conjecture, and like Fermat's last theorem was proved, and mathematicians agree that that's evidence. There are scientific theories that are debated in articulate ways. When there's sufficient evidence, then scientists, whether they're from Muslim countries, uh, Israel, uh, Egypt, the US, with very different theological views, agree. Whereas within humanities, you're not going to get the kind of consensus just within the humanities community that you have within the scientific community because we have a, a different standard for what we consider evidence. Right. Well, one, I don't know, sometimes people may try to make, and it's probably useful, a distinction between proof, which belongs in math and law, <laughs> and then evidence. Um, that may be a bit more loony. Um, you, know, you can make an argument. You yeah, there may be sufficient evidence, but you wouldn't call it proof. Well, well maybe we should ask ourselves a question, too. Like, you know, what, what's our standard for believing in something? Like, when do we say, okay, I should believe that, versus, because, you, you, you know, I've met people who, whose standard for belief is very low. They're like, you know, if my religion says it, I believe it, and I'm gonna force myself to believe it. Even when I wake up in the middle of the night and don't believe it, I'm gonna force myself to believe it. Is that the right reason to believe? I mean, I, I like the whole proof, evidence type of thing, corroborated facts, evidence, in order to believe something, I, you know, that seems like a good reason for me to believe something. But should we? Is that not the right, not the right course of action to take for belief? I don't know. Isn't that what the humanities does for us? It gives us a means of communicating these um, uh, principles and, like I say, these broader cultural themes and such, so that we can use this to pass our culture down to the next generation and spread the culture to other unknowing cultures at that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Rep. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. No. It, you know, some of the, the uh, benefits of studying history of mythology and, and, and understanding history um, is that it allows you to, uh, and this kind of reminds me of something that they were talking about at the uh, uh, fake news thing uh, panel. Uh, that you know that there are these narratives that need to be satisfied, right? You have A and then you have not A. You know, you have to get something in its, in its opposite. And that, and that structure is always there. Uh, we have lots of mental shortcuts that the, the uh, media uses in order to convey a lot of information very quickly. And often it, it kind of degenerates into things like uh, uh, cliches about. Florida man, yeah, right, totally, right, yeah. But, but there's that, but you know, if, if you, if, the disasters are covered in, the, in in a very similar way. You know, you have the initial reports, then you have the the second wave of people when journalists actually show up in whatever country it is has had this huge natural disaster, uh, and you, you get the last couple of uh, rescues, but that that that's about it, and then you project ahead to the difficulties that will be faced, and that structure. Um, is is constant when you look at all these different types of, of, of media narratives, um, and our culture kind of has those tropes too. They're efficient ways of packing a lot of information, packing understanding into uh, statements. Um, you know, you get in uh, some reporting, you have a villain, and we know what a, you know having a villain means. Um, 
uh, understanding some of that background lets you unpack culture um, and explore it and, and, and see what the relationships are. Um, we have some time, so if anybody has uh, questions, please, there's a microphone there. Oh, here they go. Here they go. <laughs> no floor, then. Uh, I'm going to raise. Okay. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh, I'm actually an econ major, and one of the problems we run into with that is it's a mix of hard sciences. I can measure GDP, I can measure population numbers, outputs, all of that. But then when it comes down to people's behavior, it's much harder to quantify. So when you're dealing with these fields where it's not necessarily possible to quantify it, that the best you can do is observational, maybe some experimental. How do you address the inherent, I guess, subjectiveness of how that is interpreted? Because ultimately, that's what a lot of it comes down to. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that this is at the core of, of the debate here. I think this is why there's this clash between the sciences and the humanities. The, the, the science folks are saying, hey, we have evidence for what we believe or what, what we interpret and you humanities. But I know that's not, because you know, like humanities have a different value, I think. But there's a little bit of geek snobbery going on, maybe from both sides. And how do we resolve that? And uh, what, how do you feel about it? I mean, Bob, I know you're really passionate. And you're well, really I think passionate about this. Some of the things with the, the humanities, you have to be comfortable with some uncertainty sometimes. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, yeah it, it, but it may not be for in, in the sciences, they, there's a reason they call it theory. Even everyone pretty much agrees it's the truth, but it's always still tentative and open to more, as we say, evidence. Plus, um, there is uncertainty within the science all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. But even uh, if we accept the Big Bang, uh, there's uncertainty. Uh, we know what happens after the first second, what happened in the first second, and that's a major controversy. Is there a multiverse? Uh, did everything start with the Big Bang? Or, you know, so there, every, any time the scientific question seems to be answered, more questions arise. You know what gets me is, is, is that a lot of people say hypothesis when, when they really would say theory when they mean hypothesis. They mean wild ass <laughs> yes, is what they yeah. mean. Well, yeah. The general one, they, you know, it's just because really, you know, theories are groups of facts. I mean, there's some change or some some surprises that come to us, but but theories in, in science are, are groups of facts, right? And hypotheses are just kind of a speculative, you know, what if kind of thing. And I just wish people would, would use that word more often than, than they do the word theory. So we don't hear about evolution as just a theory. Yeah. Right. Well, I. I I want to point out I was using theory advisedly in that, as in the theory of evolution, not just a theory, but <laughs> theory. Um, and uh, and by the way, that's something that, even though it's a, a writing class, that tends to come up in our writing classes. Here's the thing about theories mm. in science. They're pretty much, you know, there's no just a theory. It's a theory. It's not just a theory. <laughs> well, you can start doing the deductive arguments from theories. A lot of evidence in the field oh, in order to be Absolutely. able to rise to the level of theory. Right. Like we have a theory of gravity. That means we don't know everything there is about Absolutely. gravity, but there's certainly a lot of evidence right. that we can call it a theory. And but the thing, I, I just meant to point out that there is the, the tentativeness also. And the thing to consider too is a scientific theory is based on facts. A religious claim is based on faith, and a lot of times faith is nothing more than an opinion. But again, academically, a, a claim can be made that has nothing to do with, you know, like personal belief. Because there are, I mean, there are agnostics and atheists who write about um, history of religions or theological studies and so on. Um, so it, it's not necessarily always belief-based, but evidence-based. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. 
Yeah, so I actually think of theory as a direction for that answer to the hypothesis. But anyway, my uh, question is actually another thing for you. I'm an education major. I think you're thinking about kinesthetic learning as opposed to auditory or spatial or visual. And I think that's a cool thing. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Thanks, bye. <laughs> okay. It's immersive, like language. Yeah. 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 All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask I think, I mean, from the beginning of this of this panel, there's kind of been this straw manning of an argument between the two areas. And we started with a list of the things that are in humanities and a list of the things that are in science. I think maybe a, there's been a, a mischaracterization of the whole of the whole thing. To, to me, science is a way of going about learning about the world, and humanities are another way about of going about doing that. Sometimes you need to run experiments. Sometimes you need to communicate through metaphor, and those are two very valuable ways we have of of communicating th communicating things to people and learning about the world. And they, there doesn't have to be any conflict there. There's just, there are different ways of doing things. You're right, but sometimes there is. And I suppose one of the things that, that concerns us is that we're all concerned about anti-intellectualism. Yeah. But with like the Neil deGrasse Tyson quote and some of the others, it's, you see anti-intellectualism from scientists applying it to the humanities. And we didn't, we barely touched on the, the dreaded homo. Um, because everything bad in the world somehow is POMO. Um, except for the, all the things that are bad in the world that are medieval. Um, but neither of postmodernism nor medieval technically mean bad. If you look them up in the dictionary, <laughs> the sentence I just hear is that people talk about POMO. It's like, you know, the word you want is bad. Um, well, yeah, you know, both disciplines strive to understand the world, right? And uh, and people tend to, to, to specialize and, and dive very deeply into one or the other, the premises, right? Because maybe some people are equally versed in both, right? But I like how you characterize science. Science is a tool to understand reality from, a, from an evidence-based point of view, whereas the humanities Still uses that evidence. Still uses that evidence, but, but the standard of that evidence isn't as strict as in science. Maybe I mean, is that fair? I don't know. But the, but the point, yeah. But you know, but the point is, is, is okay. This is very important for everyone's life, right? Because let's say you know we have a child, and that child is subjected to some sort of claim at school. You know, and the claim might be you know the Hindu god with the the long the, with the tusks and and, and the elephant. Uh, either the elephant Hindu god, it, you know, exists somewhere in heaven. Let's say that claim is taught to our child at school. And if that child isn't taught, you know, different ways to, to try to figure out what the truth is, they might believe said claim, and, you know, whether or not that's good or bad. But so, so I, think, I think the point is, is that science kind of tends to give us tools that are a little bit more focused in trying to find the truth because those tools are, are based on stricter forms of evidence. And maybe that's where the, I don't know, snobbery, whatever we called it before, comes from. Where, Because, you know, I've had scientists tell me, I guess we talked to CW and I talked to Lawrence Krauss the other day. He said, look, if I, if I, if once I know science, once I know the scientific method, I kind of can figure out what claims are true and what claims aren't. And he didn't say this, but, but maybe the, the, the premise was is that if I just knew humanities, I, I couldn't. So I don't know, maybe I'll throw that out. Is that... I, I know when it comes to peer review, like with math and I think with science, if a paper is rejected, it's usually for one of two reasons. Either there is a flaw, uh, so it's incorrect, or it may be true, but it's just not viewed as that important to publish. Uh, but the evidence, either way, is clear if it's there or not. Now, with humanities, I think it's... Uh, sometimes rejected because 
I don't agree with your evidence. That does not happen in uh, well, a math paper. Well, no, because the disciplines work differently. Right. Um, it's, I would hope that it's not, I don't agree with your evidence, but I find your evidence weak. But um, is there a way, there's not an objective way to determine there is sometimes. I mean, sometimes, yeah. Well, but sometimes not. Well, let me put it this way: when I've taught literature, it's in, like the first time I taught literature, uh, I very enthusiastically told my students, you know, so they weren't worried so much about the paper. There's no right interpretation of Hamlet or whatever. The new right interpretation is very strong. But then I, I realized. I had to say there are wrong interpretations. <laughs> um, something that you know that isn't supported in the text or is completely refuted by the text uh, or contextual information. No, bad, naughty, or just something because you sometimes get well, maybe Hamlet did better than. Well, maybe. Maybe, me. maybe he was beaten up when he was in junior print school or whatever. Yes. Or, yes. And that's Show me in the text where that is. Um, so, in that way, there are there are things that are just bad evidence, and there are also. We of course are talking more about literary stuff because mm -hmm. that's part of it. But there there are sometimes historical things. It's like, yeah, but you know what? Here's this document, so me. Is it fair to say that the humanities strives to understand why and how something happens, whereas the sciences strive to understand if it's true, and and to use that as a predictive model for future events and, and, and to build things? Well, that's that non-overlapping magisteria argument. <laughs> that it's the same thing. I think it's the same thing. Well, because, you, you know, I... It's also color imagery in literature. That's true. Um, and uh, right. so that would be the why. Mm -hmm. That would be the why of well, the why? humanities. Well, how do we use it? Understand how we use it and how we understand it. Yeah. You know, how, uh, well, whereas why, why it matters. Is the sledgehammer that says, you know, what, what you know, what virgin, what, you know, what, what blue, what are we talking about? Is this true or is this false? Where do we get to the next question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very fascinating. Um, so my question is, don't you think there is some overlap, at least in the value of consensus, um, in that at least if the humanities is evaluating claims that are very difficult to prove you know, and reproduce, for example, something like the historical accuracy of the biblical Exodus story, that there is at very least some consensus among historians who study this type of material that no, this is probably not a historical event and it's actually like textually based and it's a narrative event that was invented later. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and then, oh, that's another thing I was going to say. Um, we often, as skeptics, um, are concerned about you know, creationism sliding into schools, at, certainly public schools, but also what homeschoolers are be, being taught. Um, so there was a, a time when I looked into, and God help me, read um, some textbooks in English that are designed for homeschool students. And you know what? That also sucks. Um, things are actually wrong. And just really bad practices from the point of view of the humanities. Um, part of it is essentially telling students there is one way to interpret this work. Yeah. Um, and if you don't interpret this work this way, not only are you wrong, you're bad and naughty and bad. Um, I, I thought of it, yeah, yeah, I thought the, the one textbook uh, I read, uh, I thought should be titled, subtitled, and that's why they're going to hell, because it's sort of like <laughs> every author, uh, you get a little thing about their biography, and, and there's something in there where they don't say it in so many words, but basically it's, and that's why they're going to hell. Um, but and it's a really horrible way to teach humanity. When you so, looked at, at, at uh, the, the way in which creationists have mangled Beowulf. I mean, you can you can torture the Bible for all I care, but you put your hands on Beowulf, man. I don't <laughs> piss me off. You know, uh, uh, 
the, the idea is that uh, they want to reconcile, well, what they want to do is prop up the idea that, that humans coexisted with dinosaurs, uh, and the way that they do it is a Brendel, dinosaur. In fact, uh, juven juvenile T-Rex with little arms that pop off. You know, like... Um, yeah, I have a slide of that. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you, you know, you know cl claims. I, I guess you know what, what bothers me about it is when when religious leaders or you know when when cultural leaders stand up and they say they make a subjective claim or, or an opinion and they represent it as a fact. So and, and that you know that happens a lot, especially in religion. And you know we use that example well, of, you, you of Jesus power. rising from the dead. I mean, the, the minute that a minister stands up and says, "I know for a fact that Jesus rose from the dead," they're lying because that's they don't know that. They guess they, that. They, they have an opinion of that. They they think they I'm know that, but they don't know that. That's not knowledge. And her can probably speak you know, the difference between knowledge and opinion. Well, I can speak uh, about logic. And some of these fundamentalists use correct logic because with logic, your conclusion need not be true. It just needs to follow from the premises. So if one of your premises is uh, God wrote this Bible and there are no errors in it, logically a lot of the things they say follow, but they're just wrong. So I think whether in humanities or in well, science, that's you have to so, understand logic. That's why it's so important to teach uh, deductive reasoning using uh, the Catatella Witch Seed from Monty Python. <laughs> because it's all based on deductive syllogisms, and some of them are, are faulty because uh, of the logical reasoning, and some of them are faulty because they're, they're not true. Um, and yet, it all works out so that. Well, Bob pointed out that the study of that statement or whatever is the thing that has influenced the culture. And so it's still important to study the fact that people believe these things. So in other words, yeah. uh, a lie has been put out, and we believe it, and it's a woman that lie. Exactly. And, 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 and. <coughs> I, I was thinking about, where, as you were talking about um, uh, things that you state as uh, an, an confusing opinion and fact, I was thinking about some of the discussions that we're having about uh, in, in, in the public arena right now about the meaning of the Civil War. Um, uh, people, it, was it or was it not about slavery? Um, well, it was about slavery. Well, you know, yeah, yeah. Herb's Talk, about talked to a lot of people in South Carolina, and it was about states' rights. Yeah. So on slaves. On slaves. On slaves. <laughs> right. yeah. State right. They just Absolutely. changed the subject. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and. Coming to a satisfactory resolution of that question is going to depend on education um, in the humanities, I think. Well, that, that also goes back to what was said earlier about consensus. Mm -hmm. um, the, the historical consensus you know, was totally about slavery. Um, and, it, you know, the outliers as well, you know. And that's another thing that we try to, I think, teach our students in, in like the writing classes. We talk about the difference between opinion fact and, and how sometimes opinion is written in a way that it looks like fact, but it, it's being disguised. Um, and, and, and we talk about, uh, you know, looking for good sources. Uh, you know, you can find a person who seems to have all the um, necessary degrees in a particular subject and it's still an outlier. Um, you might not want to be looking at the outlier first. Um, Although they tend to be louder and show up higher in the Google yeah. results. I mean, the, right. consensus, the consensus can turn out to be wrong, but you can't just go, all these people, as, as with Clinch, oh, all these people say this. Crazy Uncle Lou, on the other hand, <laughs> says not so much. Outliers are different. Yeah. yeah. All right, next question. So uh, a lot of, uh, for I guess many many of us involved in uh, scientific skeptical uh, issues and, and causes, have to interface with the uh, public, uh, sometimes journalists and sometimes even politicians. Um, and we like to think that we have, that you know, especially on the side of scientific skepticism, we have the facts, which is why, of course, all of our politicians listen to us, and um, we we don't have to keep fighting this fight every year. Um, so I guess. Uh, 
uh, I guess my question is, uh, as somebody who is not in the humanities um, you know, field, uh, I'm an engineer who's, uh, who's promoting skeptical topics, uh, how do we get better and, uh, and kind of uh, just basically you see a path forward? Orly uh, illustrated that with the, what's the form? Um, you can give all the statistics you like, but using, I know the, the terrible word anecdote, yeah. but but using examples that that is rhetorically powerful. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't use, you don't want to use anecdotes all by themselves, but if you have the numbers to back it up, it can really help people relate on to be, a personal level. We seem to be wired for storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, the vast, most of, of human culture for most of its existence has depended on storytelling. If you didn't actually tell the story, it was forgotten. The knowledge was gone. That part of the culture disappeared. Um, so we, are, we have, there are a number of, of things that we're really good at, at, at memorizing just kind of by necessity. Um, stories are, are, are one. Um, and verse, music, we can remember the lyrics to Ice Ice Baby, but you know... Um, That's why there's more oral poetry uh, that still exists than oral prose. The danger is, is that, is that good storytelling overwrites the intellect a lot of times. It, it, and it, it makes people yeah. believe but, it, but in terms, it's not factual. In terms of, you know, like say a scientist talking to a politician in, in a story, you have to recognize the religion of the politician, which is getting reelected. Yeah. So you need to frame the science in a way this can show how it's good for your constituents and our community, and focus more on that than the weeds of the science, just to try to get a win-win situation with politicians. And that's why you need to think of audience. Mm -hmm. One last question. Hi, so I'm one of those humanities people. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to make two comments and then get your thoughts on them. Uh, first off, uh, you're talking about like empirical research and stuff, but I haven't heard anyone talk about like um, qualitative research where you take like, uh, say you have samples and people tell you stories and then you get trends and then you can get quantitative research from those trends. So that's a thing where the humanities can get more hard data off of soft things. And then another comment on the humanities is sciences are, and like the sciences in general would be in the humanities or not, or in a hard science, can uh, give you the like the like explanation for a phenomenon. And then like humanities give you the like, is it good or bad? It gives you the moral judgment. And that's where I think the humanities like really, really shine. Can we bring back dinosaurs versus should we bring back dinosaurs? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's kind of where I think the humanities are important. I, I think Dragon Con has proved we yeah, absolutely should, should bring, bring back, back dinosaurs. dinosaurs. <laughs> We're starting a campaign. Uh, dance. Dance. <laughs> birds. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Birds. Yeah, I think it's the question of why, you know, versus, you know, how. Yes, right. Because, um, because you know the quantitative data that you know we, we could find out, you know how masses of people feel about a certain subject, and you know versus you know the, the facts of what, you know what that subject actually is. What its parsec. Sometimes it's, it it seems to me that in, in the uh, people who value the sciences, um, uh, Sometimes when you take it to extreme, you get to something that's scientism. So unless you can show it with numbers, it's not real. Um, uh, and I, I'm thinking about um, there was a you know uh, there was an analysis of a, a, a scrap of parchment, the the Jesus's uh, wife. Yeah. Uh, the Gospel of Mrs. Jesus. The Gospel of Mrs. Jesus. It was just a scrap of said like, and then Jesus said, "Take my wife, please." And it, it, that's, like it, it's kind of all that it said that he could really decipher. Um, and but it ticked all the boxes for so many it, people. Yeah, I mean, it was it it, it sent, well. The first thing is to be skeptical because it gives uh, a popular strain of, of argument in modern theological circles about whether or not women should be priests, um, can they be true followers of Christ, that sort of thing. What's their role in the church? It gave them like exactly the evidence that they needed that, that women were valued at the very early, so if you're going to base your 
modern practice on traditions, this is a, a good early tradition to base it on. And for the Da Vinci coders? Oh, oh. Yeah. 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 right? Well, what are they after? But, but the, the, uh, the thing is, it wasn't a, people weren't, you know, uh, they examined the. Uh, the hook is coming out. Mm -hmm. The hook is coming out. Is that that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think, I think the bottom line is we need all the right. Yeah, we gotta close it. Yeah, yeah. the scientists were wrong. The humanities were wrong. <laughs> 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 all right, if you don't want to have more of a Sorry. discussion, we, we can do it outside. We really do have to get So thank you, everyone. We don't even have time for shameless plugs at this point. But thank you very much for coming.